Please okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, so today's presentation uh, will be slightly different from the first class. So here I will be showing some say, clinical scenarios and clinical scenarios. And I hope all of you can join in and somebody, one of you can give the answer. Uh, uh, so we will be dealing with 12 clinical scenarios today. So we will be covering dementia, Parkinsonism and other movement disorders today and the rest of the topics in the third session. So first of all, dementia. So if you have a patient who comes to you with the dementia and you have a basic MRI, what are the things that you should look for? In MRI, you should look for global atrophy. So here in this image, you have on the right side, an advanced uh, uh, dementia patient with a global atrophy and you can see the uh, typical knife edge uh, shaped guy, right? In addition to that, in some situations, you should look for focal atrophy. Which are the areas you uh, focus on when you are looking for focal atrophy? Different dementia conditions can have atrophy affecting different areas of the brain. So you can have atrophy of the hippocampus. You can have atrophy of the temporal lobe per se. You can have frontal atrophy and you can have parietal atrophy. So which area of the brain is appropriate that can give a valuable clue towards the diagnosis? Uh, Dr. Ramakrishna, I think somebody else's uh, audio is uh, turned on, I believe. Dr. Varun, can you mute the others? Ah, it is now. Okay. Nobody, no, no, only sir's audio is on, sir. Okay, so selective focal atrophy affecting involving different areas of the brain can help us in diagnosing different uh, causes of dementia. In addition to this, we should look for evidence of vascular disease. So vascular disease, you will look for white matter lesions, presence of lacunes, and also presence of strategic infarcts. So what are strategic infarcts that we will be covering shortly? Nowadays, when, whenever you get an MRI report of a patient with a dementia, these are some of the scales that are commonly mentioned. This is important not only for your exam, but once you start practicing, your patients will come and ask you what this means. So basically you have four scales which are very important and commonly used. You have the global cortical atrophy scale, which is otherwise known as the PASS square scale, the MTA scale for medial temporal lobe atrophy, the KEDAM score for parietal atrophy and the well-known FASEKA scale for white matter lesions. In the GCS scale or the PASS square scale, it is a visual scale. So basically you have to have, you know, rather than a volumetric measurement, when you look at the MRI, what uh, uh, you see based on the atrophy of the gyrae, that's how you classify. So this is how it is classified where GCA zero means no cortical atrophy and GCA3 refers to severe end-stage atrophy, which we earlier mentioned as the knife blade appearance of the gyri. So here you can see GCA0, GCA1, there is mild atrophy, GCA2, they, there is progression of the atrophy and significant global atrophy in GCA3. This is the MTA scale for medial temporal atrophy. In medial temporal atrophy, you are looking at three parameters, the width of the choroid fissure, width of the temporal horn, and the height of hippocampal formation. So in, you can see in MTA4 that there is significant severe atrophy of the hippocampus. So again, this is scored from zero to four. Normally, in a person who is aging, there can be atrophy of the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus. So a score of more than or equal to two is considered abnormal in a person less than 75 years. And in a person aged more than 75 years, score more than or equal to three is considered abnormal. The key down score... Use the mouse, so if necessary, we will take care of any issues. Okay. Kedam score for parietal atrophy. This is very important, especially in patients with Alzheimer's dementia. What you have to understand is that even though Alzheimer's dementia, typically you mentioned that there is medial temporal lobe involvement, 
in a pre-senile Alzheimer's dementia patient, there can be early atrophy of the parietal lobe. So the atrophy of the precuneus is particularly characteristic of Alzheimer's dementia. So again, this is graded from grade zero to three, with the grade three being end stage or knife blade atrophy. So you, here you have the Kedam score and in grade three, you can see that there is significant atrophy of the parietal lobe. So here you can see the symmetrical bilateral parietal atrophy, which is grade three. So this is the well-known Paseca scale for white matter lesions. So Paseca zero, that refers to that there is no white matter lesion or a single white matter lesion. In Paseca one, there are multiple small white matter lesions. In Faseca 2, there occurs confluency or the lesions join together or bridge, whereas there are large confluent lesions in Faseca grade 3. Strategic infarctions. So this is something that they commonly ask, which are the areas that you refer to when you call it as strategic infarction? So infarctions in areas which are crucial for the normal cognitive function of the brain, that is referred to as strategic infarction. So this can be involving the middle cerebral arterial territory, posterior cerebral artery territory. It can be even watershed uh, infarctions that we discussed in the last class or lacunar infarctions. So some examples. So here you can see bilateral thalamic infarctions. The dorsomedial thalamus is affected and this is often associated with cognitive dysfunction. Always you should uh, ideally use for lacunar infarcts and infarcts or other lesions which are close to the CSF, you should look at the T2. Many a time when we, we all are used to seeing the flare in the beginning and look for lesions, we did, uh, rely on flare. But here you can see that in the flare image, you cannot easily identify the thalamic lesion, which is looking high, iso intense to the surrounding structures. In the T2 image, you can you have the uh, thalamic infarct, which is clearly seen. So T2 should be used for uh, clearly localizing the lacunar infarctions. So this is another example of a strategic infarction, but keep in mind that such a PCA territory infarct that you see here, it should be located in the dominant hemisphere before it can give rise to a cognitive dysfunction. So here you have a uh, an infarct, which is located in the uh, in, in the PCA territory, again, in the temporo-occipital association area. This is a similar image where you have a PCA territory in fact, and here there is salamic involvement, and this leads to dementia. Now coming to the clinical scenarios. So scenario one, 66-year-old gentleman was brought to OPD by family members. They informed that he would ask for food again, after forgetting that he had eaten already. He would go out for shopping, but will come back buying only one or two things on the list. And going ahead, he started to get confused in un, uh, unfamiliar settings. So this was the patient's MRI. Can somebody tell me the diagnosis and the finding that you see in the MRI? Yeah, Dr. Asta, you can try. Uh, sir, in this, so we are seeing uh, left uh, bilateral, sorry, hippocampal atrophy. And also there's middle temporal lobe atrophy. So it's rest of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So here you have a patient who has got a working memory impairment followed by visual spatial involvement. So this is the typical progression that you expect in a patient with Alzheimer's dementia. So here, like Dr. Asta said, there is atrophy of the hippocampi with compensatory dilation of the dilatation of the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. So this is a case of Alzheimer's dementia. We already discussed that in a patient with pre-senile Alzheimer's dementia, the most striking finding is a parietal atrophy with the atrophy of the posterior cingulum and the precuneus. Hippocampus may even be normal in very early cases. So this is a diagrammatic representation showing the posterior cingulate cortex and the precuneus. Again, the posterior cingulate cortex is shown. Patients with end-stage Alzheimer's dementia. So like we discussed in the MTA scoring, there can be extreme hippocampal and medial temporal lobe atrophy with an MTA score of four. And in addition to that, in advanced dementia, there can be global atrophy. So here there is global atrophy with a GCA scale of three. 
what you have to remember is that the global cortical atrophy will finally happen in all end stage diseases. So when the dementia progresses in all conditions, finally you will have GCA3. That is not specific of a particular diagnosis. So what we saw was that patients present with early involvement of working memory followed by involvement of visual spatial this followed by visual spatial dysfunction. But there are variants of Alzheimer's dementia where patients can present with early progressive impairment of visual spatial and visual perceptual capabilities. So this is a patient, such a patient's MRI. Can somebody tell me the diagnosis? Posterior cortical atrophy. Yeah. So posterior cortical atrophy or the Benson syndrome. So here you have involvement of the parietal lobe more than the uh, temporal lobe, and these patients may present with early impairment of the visual spatial function. Now, coming to scenario two, a 56 year old man was fired from his job due to inappropriate behavior. He started berating junior workers for mild offenses and had starting, started to make inappropriate sexual references with female colleagues. Over time, his appearance and personal hygiene deteriorated. So this was the patient's MRI. What is the diagnosis? Behavioral variant of FTD. Yeah, correct. So frontotemporal dementia can have two variants. So it can be either a behavioral variant or a language involvement. So here in the image, you can see significant atrophy, which is symmetrically involving the frontal and temporal lobe. There is relative sparing of the so here the occipital and parietal lobes are not involved. The involvement is mainly the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. The sylvian fissure is markedly widened here. In this first and second image, you can see the markedly widened sylvian fissure and the sylvian fissure separates which lobe from which lobe? Frontal and parietal with temporal. Yeah, so frontal and parietal lobe from the temporal is separated by the sylvian fissure, which runs from the base, or starts from the basal forebrain. So here we have the gross picture also, which is showing the involvement of the frontal and temporal lobe. So this is a case of frontal temporal dementia, behavioral variant. Frontal temporal lower degeneration is otherwise known as PICS disease. The onset of dementia is usually between 50 and 60 years. So slightly earlier than Alzheimer's dementia. In a person younger than age 60, the most common cause of dementia is FTD. So like we discussed, there can be the behavioral variant and the language variant. So the image that we discussed, we saw that the atrophy of the frontal lobe was quite symmetrical. So is it possible for a patient to have asymmetry in you know, a patient with frontal temporal dementia? Can they have asymmetry? Can somebody answer? Is it possible for asymmetry to occur in a patient with a frontotemporal dementia? In semantic variant. Okay. So, so you, you, the, what is this MRI showing? Anterior temporal atrophy. Anterior temporal atrophy. Yeah. So this is a patient with a semantic variant frontotemporal dementia where there is uh, asymmetrical atrophy of the temporal lobe, they, they mainly the extra temporal involvement, and also there is atrophy of the hippocampus and the temporal bone. So, we already discussed this so in advanced cases, the atrophy can be so severe that the gyri may appear as sharp as, as knives, and this is called uh, knife blade atrophy. Nowadays, we frequently rely on FDG PET for differentiation of Alzheimer's dementia and frontotemporal dementia. On the left-hand corner, you have a patient with a normal uptake and uh, Alzheimer's with a posterior uh, pre uh, pre uh, predominant involvement and a frontotemporal dementia where you have frontal hypometabolism. Vascular dementia, we already discussed. So vascular dementia is the second most common cause of dementia when you put together all the age groups. After Alzheimer's dementia, this is the second most common cause of dementia. So again, we will not be discussing that further. So you can have patients with uh, white matter lesions as seen in the Fasekas grading or patients with a strategic infarcts, which leads to a stepwise deterioration in cognition leading to a patient of vascular dementia. What you have to keep in mind is that not all patients will come 
with a single diagnosis. Many a time you can have a mixed picture. Patients with, uh, there will be patients with Alzheimer's dementia who have dilated ventricles and findings suggestive of a NPH on the MRI. So here you have a patient with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. So there are periventricular white matter lesions which are hypointense on T1. If we had a T, T2 image, they would have been hyperintense. And in addition to that, you can see the significant medial temporal and hippocampal atrophy, which is pointing towards Alzheimer's dementia. Now, coming to scenario three. 74-year-old man presented with mild forgetfulness and occasional mild headache. So he was seen on outpatient basis and MRI was done. So this was the MRI picture. One month later, the patient presented to casualty with sudden severe headache and left homonymous hemianopia. So the clinical scenario put together and looking at the MRI, what is the diagnosis? Cerebral okay. amyloid angiopathy. Okay. So you are saying this is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Why is it not a hypertensive patient uh, with uh, micro hemorrhages and I am saying this is then atypical. We discussed that no low bar hematomas can occur in a patient with the hyper accelerated hypertension also. So why is this not hypertension? Cortical micro hemorrhages sparing the basal ganglia. Very good. So here you have micro hemorrhages which, is, which are predominantly involving the periphery. You can see that the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, these are not affected. And again, even though low bar hematoma can occur, the classical sites of a hypertensive bleed will be involving the thalamus, the putamen, the cerebellar dentate nucleus, etc. So cerebral amyloid angiopathy, like we, you, you mentioned, there will be my, micro hemorrhages, which are of different ages, and these are much more common in the parietal and occipital lobes. The basal ganglia, brainstem, and cerebellum, which are the favorite sites of high hypertensive microbleed, these are typically spared. And the patient can have a variety of type of hemorrhages. So they can have micro hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhages, or even low bar hematomas. So the MRI finding will be typically gradient or SWA sequence, which shows multiple micro hemorrhages typically in a peripheral location as we saw in our patient's MRI. In addition to this, the flare sequence may show moderate to severe white matter hyperintensities. So hypertensive microhemorrhages like we discussed usually are more centrally, centrally located, the basal ganglia, thalamus, and also involved in the brainstem in the pons. So here you have the gradient images with cerebral amyloid angiopathy showing the peripherally located microbleeds. And these are flare images of the same patient which show Fasekas grade two white matter hyperintensities. So the white matter lesions have started becoming confluent. So that is why you have uh, Fasekas grade two. So this is another uh, example uh, of a gradient image in a patient with a cerebral uh, amyloid angiopathy showing microbleeds. Now coming to scenario four, a 60 year old man presented with rapidly progressive dementia for the past one month. You saw him in the OPD and some, somebody opened the door and suddenly he jerks, he startles very easily. He's very fidgety. This is the MRI. What is the diagnosis? Can you describe the MRI finding also, please? Ribbon. So you have the cortical ribboning, the, the hyperintensities which are seen in the diffusion image involving the cortex, the gray matter, and also in the flare sequence. So CJD occurs due to conformational change of a prion protein that leads to a toxic gain of function. 90% of the time, CJD is sporadic and typically occurs in patients over the age of 60. Initially, the cortex will be affected and over time, these hyperintensities can spread to involve the striatum and also the thalamus. Though we say that the thalamic involvement is uh, typical of a variant CJD, the sheer prevalence of sporadic CJD, that is 90% cases, it is sporadic CJD. So because of the number of cases, again, thalamic involvement also will be commonly seen in a patient with advanced sporadic CJD. So here you have the hyperintense signal on diffusion weighted and in the flare also involving the cerebral gray matter. 
So this is the typical hockey stick sign where you have hyperintensity involving the, this is the pulvinar nucleus and also the dorsomedial thalamic nucleus of the thalamus. This together gives rise to an appearance of a hockey stick. So here in the first image, you have restricted diffusion and hyperintensity in the cordage and the putamen and the thalamus. The thalamic involvement involving both pulvinar nucleus and the dorsomedial thalamus that is together known as hockey stick sign. So this is a patient with the variant CJD which was earlier known as mad cow disease where you have the pulvinar sign. The, here there is hyperintensity involving the, uh, the posterior part of the thalamus that is the pulvinar nucleus. Now coming to scenario five. 42 year old lady presented with history of migraine for the past 10 years. She complains of difficulty in concentrating at work and forgetfulness for the past one year. One spine day, she presents to the casualty with a left hemiparesis. So MRI showed a lacunar infarct in the diffusion image. The flyer sequence showed this. What is the time? Why do you say it is cadacid? Temporal lobe hyperintensity is quite matter. So the anterior tem uh, temporal pole. So you have confluent white matter hyperintensities along with the lacunar infarcts and involvement of the anterior temporal lobe, the temporal pole involved. Can somebody tell me which is the other characteristic site which is mentioned in addition to the temporal pole when you are considering a diagnosis of cadacin? External capsule. Yeah, very good. External capsule. So cadacin that is cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Autosomal dominant inheritance and the affected gene is NOTS3. The small vessels of the brain affected. So patients presented, present with cognitive dysfunction, migraine, stroke-like episodes, or progressive uh, behavioral disturbances. So you will have lacunar infarcts, white matter hyperintensities, and microbleeds. So here in the first image, you can see the anterior temporal pole involvement. Here you can see the lacunar infarcts. This is the external capsule involvement that we mentioned in the image, the second image. So these images show extensive symmetric white matter hyperintensities with multiple old lacunar infarctions, the red arrows. There is hypertensity in the white matter of the temporal pole here and in the external capsule. So and also you can see that there is a relative sparing of the occipital lobe and orbital frontal cortex. So the two areas that you look for specifically when you have white matter involvement, that is at the temporal pore and at the external capsule when you are considering a diagnosis of cadacin. So this is another patient that will commonly present to you. So again, earlier we discussed genetic and degenerative or sporadic conditions. So this is an acquired cause of dementia. Can somebody give the diagnosis? NPH. NPH. So they see, there are no, the ventricular dilatation is not severely significant. There is no periventricular ooze. And uh, the, this hyperintensity, if you have considered it as an ooze, is involving the frontal lobe only. Here you can see there is basic frontal involvement. There is gliosis is there here in the temporal lobe. Do you want to revise your diagnosis once? Uh, yeah. NMDR. Mm, NMDR. So this is a patient with traumatic brain injury who has uh, come with, uh, no, for, uh, over a long term, the patient has developed gliosis and you have bilateral involvement of the frontal lobe and the temporal pole is affected and there is gliosis, significant gliosis. So this is a patient with a TBA with strictly. Now coming to Parkinsonism and other movement disorders. So Parkinson's disease, typically we always say that the MRI is normal. So Parkinson's disease occurs due to the idiopathic degeneration of dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra parts compact. So I think somebody, there is some noise coming from somebody's system. Yeah, now it is okay. So this is the gross image where you can see that in the first image, you have the normal 
no uh, substantia nigra and here in the patient with parkinson's disease there is loads of the dopaminergic neurons so the again this is a gross image uh, which is showing the substantia normal substantia nigra and the substantia nigra in a patient with parkinson's disease though we say that patients with uh, uh, parkinson's disease the mri is normal nowadays with the three tesla imaging you have the uh, other advanced imaging modalities that can help you with a significant sensitivity to diagnose parkinson's disease you, you, they might not show you this in the exam or they can but you uh, know this is maybe asked in your exam so neuromelanin sensitive imaging so here uh, here you have neuromelanin sensitive imaging so this is a 3t image and the first image is a healthy control you can see the hyper intensity this is a, at the level of midbrain you can see the hyper intensity of the substantia nigra and in a patient with parkinson's disease and other atypical parkinsonian syndrome you can see that the hyper intensity of the substantia nigra is lost the next important sign is a swallow tail sign or a dorsolateral nigral hyperintensity this is an swa sequence in a 3t image and here you can see that there is a hypo intensity of the uh, normal substantia nigra and in a parkinson's disease patient you have in the dorsolateral uh, substantia nigra there is a hyper intensity and this will be a symmetrical in patients uh, with the atypical parkinsonian syndrome also so you can just use it to diagnose parkinson's parkinsonism but it will be difficult to differentiate between parkinson's disease and other atypical parkinsonian syndromes so remember these signs because they are associated with the approximately 80 percentage sensitivity you can pick up patients with uh, parkinsons scenario 6 65 year old man presented with recurrent folds for the past 6 months he had a recent admission for pneumonia clinical examination showed impaired up gaze mri was done what is the diagnosis and what is the sign that you are seeing csp coming yes, sign mm -hmm. yeah so can you tell me what is the, the beak of the hummingbird what, what constitutes the beak of the hummingbird okay sir so here you have psp psp is a tavopathy it is not optic fact we will come to that psp is a tavopathy very bad prognosis onset is between 50 and 70 years of age you have pronounced the atrophy of the midbrain that we saw and this is respond the vertical gaze center in the midbrain is affected which is responsible for the typical upward gaze paralysis and in addition to that you will have in on the imaging atrophy of the superior cerebellar pedunculus so this is an additional distinctive feature of psp in a patient with a msa you will have atrophy of the middle cerebellar pedunculus so this is the hummingbird sign so in a sagittal t1 image there is thinning of the anterior posterior diameter so this is the thinning of the anterior posterior diameter and you have abnormal shape of the rostral midbrain tegmentum so here you can see that the this is the hummingbird beak normally the, this is the on the left hand side you have the upper border of midbrain which is convex the convex upper border and here in a patient with psp you have the concave upper border so this is rough, the atrophy of the midbrain which leads to reduced anterior posterior diameter the concave upper border of the midbrain and the long beak which is constituted by the floor of the third ventricle this is together referred to as the hummingbird sign so the posterior and central portion of the floor of the third ventricle this resembles the hummingbird's long thin sharp beak so this uh, they will ask you for your exam what you know the hummingbird sign what does it constitute and what forms the beak of the hummingbird so in addition to that there is a uh, you no know, hypo intensity of the substantia nigra also can somebody tell me what are the marked uh, signs this is also a patient with a psp what is this arrow this this arrow what sign is that mickey mouse sign yeah. mickey mouse sign and what is this one and one okay this is so this is segmental atrophy so this is mickey mouse sign and this is the, like uh, you said tegmental atrophy which is leading to the so this uh, morning glory sign so the increased space between the cerebral peduncles 
So this that is what this red arrow is showing. This is called the Mickey Mouse sign. And you have a concavity at the of the lateral margin of the tegmentum, and this is known as the morning glory sign. So we will take a break from uh, neurology for a second. Uh, are there any other uh, Mickey Mouse signs that you know of? What is this Mickey Mouse sign? Any takers? Femoral vein and femoral artery. Uh, very good, correct. So you have femoral artery, femoral vein, and the great saphenous vein. This is an ultrasound image, and this is another Mickey Mouse sign that there is there in medicine. Common femoral artery, common femoral vein, and the great saphenous vein on ultrasound at the level just inferior the inguinal crease. So this they will ask you if you are getting distinction. So if this question is asked, means then you don't need to worry. Whoever answered is uh, already <laughs> the exam has been quite easy for them. Now coming to scenario seven, 56 year old lady presented with history of imbalance while walking with fine tremors affecting bilateral upper limb for the past one year. She had started walking with the forward stoop over the past two years. Recently she started complaining of blackout sensation on getting up and had two syncopal attacks in the past one month. So this is the MRI. What is the diagnosis? And Can what I is the heart cross bone? Okay. Can you tell me what is the reason for hot cross bun sign in a patient with MSM? MCP atrophy. It is uh, not MCP atrophy. It is inside the pons only. You, know? you have the hyperintensity inside the pons, not only not in the middle cerebral uh, Atrophy of pontocerebral atrophy. Yeah. So in MSA, there is pronounced cerebellar atrophy and Severe atrophy of the pons leading to flattening of pons. So here you can see the usually convex pons is flattened. The hot cross bun sign is a result of the pontine hyperensity and it is typical for MSAC. You might see a patient with the MSAC, but uh, the MRI might not show. Many a time in the initial stage of the disease, the um, uh, hot cross bun sign might not manifest. The sign is due to selective loss of the myelinated transverse pontocerebellar fibers and neurons in the pontine raphe with the preservation of the pontine tegmentum and the corticospinal tracts. MSA, unlike uh, PSP, is, here MSA is a synucleonopathy. So onset is usually between the age of 50 and 60, and you have the three classif the classification into MSA C, MSA P, and the MSA A, the autonomic variety variant, which was earlier known as Scheidrager syndrome. So MSA C was earlier known as olivopontocerebellar atrophy, and MSA P was formerly known as striatonigral degeneration. So this is what I mentioned. This is the follow-up images of a patient. So here you can see on the left-hand side that there is no hot cross bun sign. And three years later, when you do the MRI again, the patient has developed the hot cross bun sign. M MSA is majority of the time a clinical diagnosis. So you have a typical patient with the symmetrical Parkinsonism, forward tube, uh, you, uh, bladder symptoms with the uh, urgency and incontinence and pyramidal tract involvement with brisk reflexes, then you think of a diagnosis of MSA. So the MRI, even if the sign is not showing, uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. In addition to uh, the hot cross bun sign, you can have hyperintense signals due to atrophy of the inferior olive that you see here, the red arrow, and you can have Hyperintensity and atrophy of the middle cerebellar pedicle. In PSP, we discussed that there can be hyperintensity of the superior cerebellar pedicle. MSFP, there will be putaminal atrophy, and this leads to putaminal rim sign, which is seen here. Scenario 8. 60-year-old lady presented with recurrent falls and abnormal uncontrolled posturing of the right upper limb while walking. She has had memory issues for the past one year. What is the diagnosis? CBD. So there are some examiners who will not like uh, short forms. Uh, so, Corticobasal degeneration, parietal yeah. atrophy. Uh, so you know, if you don't know what they will start scratching you for, 
Uh, they, they, nobody is uh, going to be very aggressive nowadays, but uh, the thing is that once they irritate you, they will, uh, you, uh, your confidence takes a hit. So you, here you have asymmetrical parietal cortical atrophy. And also uh, you, uh, uh, here it is not there. there. There can be hyperintensity of the bike matter on the T2 weighted image. Cort uh, Corticobasal degeneration, it is a tauopathy like uh, PSP. The patient will have uh, asymmetrical posterior parietal and frontal cortical atrophy. The most commonly affected area is the one that is shown in this image, the superior parietal lobule. And uh, even though it was not there in the, this image, there can be hyperintensity also. Oh, uh, yes, there is an image here. So here you have the hyperintensity, which is shown by the red arrow. And there is atrophy of the precentral gyrus and the superior parietal lobule. Now coming to the next scenario. A 56-year-old man presented with chorea and irritability. His mother also had a similar illness and died at 62. This is the MRI finding. Yeah. Chordate had atrophy. Chordate atrophy bilateral. So you have chordate, bilateral chordate atrophy and the dilatation of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. And so this is a patient with Huntington's disease, which is the most common inherited form of chorea. It is a trinucleotide repeat disorder of the DNA based sequence CAG on chromosome 4. Again, the inheritance is autosomal dominant, and you know, uh, uh, the uh, anticipation might be present with the patients developing the disease at an earlier age in subsequent generations. So, Huntington's disease, the imaging will show characteristic atrophy of the chordate nucleus and enlargement of the frontal bones of the lateral ventricle. So, the appearance is referred to as box car ventricles. Scenario 10, 28-year-old presented with coarse postural tremors, imbalance, and jaundice. Wilson. Okay, Wilson. What does the MRI show? Uh, Hyperintensity in lentiform nucleus and uh, globus pallid and telomere. Telomere. Okay. okay. I will ask you another question. The same MRI, a patient has presented with a febrile illness followed by a severe symmetrical echinetic rigid syndrome and the MRI is showing this finding. What is the diagnosis? Japanese encephalitis. Yeah. So Japanese Wilson, encephalitis. Japanese encephalitis. So Japanese encephalitis MRI is a close mimic when you have basal ganglia and thalamic involvement symmetrically. So the clinical history is always important. So whenever you, so the, like radiologists always tell, if you don't have the clinical history, a very, very Wilson's disease patient might very well get a DD of Japanese encephalitis. So Wilson's disease is a disease which is recessively inherited. The patients present with the movement disorders, Parkinsonism, dystonia, tremor, and there is selective brain copper accumulation in the basal ganglia. So you, here you have the KF ring. So the most common, what is the most common MRI finding in a patient with Wilson's disease? Hyperintensity in basal ganglia, bilateral. Uh, so is it chordate? Is it putamen? Is it globus pallidus? Putamen. Globus. So, yeah. Abnormal T2 hyperintensity in the putamen is the most common MRI abnormality in Wilson's disease. What is the described sign at the level of pons in a patient with Wilson's disease? Panda sign. A panda. Miniature not, panda. No, not panda sign. It is the, uh, you know. So the face of the giant panda sign that is at the level of midbrain and face of a miniature panda sign or the cub of the panda sign is seen at the level of pons. So this is the so this is the uh, panda sign at the level of the midbrain. So uh, can somebody tell me what constitutes the panda sign? The face of the giant panda sign. The red nucleus bilateral form the eyes, uh, periaqueductal gray matter from the nose, and superior uh, bilateral tegmentum from the uh, form is the bilateral ear, and uh, superior colliculus from the mouth. Correct. The only, the only thing that you made a mistake is what forms the ears you said? Tegmentum. Not tegmentum, no? The lateral portion of the substantia nigra parts of the 
that forms the years. So rest of the thing, you got it correct. So you have the normal intensity of the red nucleus and the lateral portion of the substantia nigra parts reticulata, the high signal intensity of the tegmentum and the hypo intensity of the, so this is the, this is the superior colliculus. There's a superior colliculus, which is hyper intense, which forms the mount. This is the red nucleus. This is the substantia nigra. So this is the giant panda sign at the level of midbrain. So you have the, this is the face of the miniature panda sign. Can you tell me what are the components of the miniature panda sign? So the face of the miniature panda sign is seen at the level of the pontine tegmentum. So here you have the medial. The, so this, this is the miniature panda sign. During my uh, residency period, this is something that you I had significant doubt of. So I think uh, uh, real clarity go, I got while I am preparing this presentation only. So here you have the medial longitudinal, the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the central tegmental tract the hypo intensity that forms the eyes of the panda and you here you have the cerebral aqueduct opening into the fourth ventricle which forms the nose and mouth of the panda and inferiorly you have the superior medullary vein superior cerebellar pedangles form the panda's cheeks so this components of the panda sign where it is found all of these things you should be thorough when you are going for the exam Double panda sign. So when you have the midbrain, the face of the giant panda and the face of the miniature panda, both signs when it is present in the same patient, then it is referred to as the double panda sign. Before we move ahead, can somebody tell me what is the diagnosis? This is the spot of I of tiger sign. I of Hello, what's the spot this? Very good. So can you tell me what when you describe the MRI finding? There is a high point intensity in the globus pallidus, uh, suggestive of the iron deposition, and a uh, hyper intensity in the upper portion is a gliosis, like look like the eye of tiger. Okay, so there is symmetrical hyper intensity of the central portion of globus pallidus, which is surrounded by a marked high point intense rim and resembles the eye of the tiger, and it is seen in neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation type one, classically, not type two. So yeah, patients with uh, present with adult onset dystonic syndromes, and these are the types that you very well know, NBA type 1, type 2, acerloplasminemia, and infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. Scenario 12. Uh, the, there are two more Dr. important uh, DD. Dr. Kutchian, yeah. there are two more important differential, like this uh, hypermagnesemia. And uh, cocaine, cocaine <laughs> intoxication. That yes. also, can you discuss once? So, who can tell me the DDs of high of tiger sign? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Uh, Hepatolenticular degeneration, chronic cirrhosis, uh, accumulation of magnesium. So, so uh, magnesium accumulation, disease. Wilson's disease, and sometimes in patients with OP poisoning also. So, OP poisoning, Wilson's disease, and uh, uh, no, magnesium uh, de de deposition. These are the situations where you can have eye of the tiger sign in other conditions. Okay. Now, coming to the next scenario. 72-year-old man presented with slow, unsteady, cautious gait, memory issues, and urinary incontinence. This was the MRI picture. What is the diagnosis and what do you see? NPH. Uh, dilated okay. ventricle. Again, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So full form. <laughs> till, you, till you pass a normal pressure hydrocephalus. After that, you can say NPH. Sure, sir. So what is the presence of preserved brain volume? Yeah. Very ventricular, who's bilateral. Very good. 
So this is the patient with normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is otherwise known as Adam syndrome. Patients will be classically present with a triad of cognitive disturbance, gait abnormality with a magnetic gait and urinary incontinence. This is thought to be due to the disruption of the periventricular white matter tracts. Imaging, you have ventricular megaly with sylvian fissure widening, periventricular hypodensity on CT and hyperintensity on T2 images, which is due to the seepage of the fluid and CSF flow studies, which we don't commonly depend on. So here you have the axial flare image, which is showing marked dilatation of the lateral ventricles. There is a ballooning of the lateral ventricles. So there, here in this image, you can see the dilated third ventricle. And this is a sagittal T1 image. You can see dilatation of the lateral ventricle and also the dilatation of the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. This is the bowing and distortion and FA, uh, distortion of the corpus callosum, which is seen here. So this is uh, the, uh, this here, the corpus callosum is thinned out and there is bowing. Sagittal T2 weighted images can demonstrate a prominent flow void in the cerebral aqueduct here and in the fourth ventricle. This also is seen in patients with uh, NPH. What is this? Evans tissue. Evan okay. Can you tell me when it is abnormal and what is the normal range? Less than 0 0.31 is normal. Okay. So this is Evans index. So here maximum width of the frontal horn. So this, this is the first measurement. The maximum width of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle and the maximum internal diameter of the skull at the same level that you can take in a CT or even in an MRI image. Normal is 0.2 to 0.25. Early ventricular megaly is between 0.25 and 0.3. Definite ventricular megaly when, is when the ratio is more than 0.3. What is this angle? Callosal angle. So what is the normal callosal angle and what do you get in a patient with NPH? It becomes more obtuse in uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. More than 90. More obtuse. So the, the colossal angle you should measure on a coronal image perpen perpendicular to the anterior commissure, posterior commissure plane at the level of the posterior commissure. Normally, uh, patients with NPH will have smaller angle. So patients with atrophy and uh, ventricular megaly, they will have larger angles. So that Normal angle is between 100 and 120 degree. In patients with NPH, it is more acute. That is, the angle is lower and it is usually between 50 to 80 degree. Now, this is not uh, what uh, we were uh, planning to cover in this session. So along with NPH, I would like to, this is, uh, they, they very commonly ask you for your exams. The normal variance of the, you know, the ventricle. So uh, these are some normal variants, the KVM septum pellucidum. The septum pellucidum is the, you know, uh, you see in between the lateral ventricle. So cavum septum pellucidum is when between the septum pellucidum, you have a fluid filled cavity. So this is the cavum septum pellucidum. And here in this image, you have additionally, a, this is the, this is the cavum septum pellucidum. And this is the cavum verge where there is a fluid filled cavity, which is separating out the fornices. So cavum septum pellucidum is a fluid filled cavity between the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. Whereas cavum verge, that is an extension of the cavum septum pellucidum between the fornices occurring in conjunction with the cavum septum pellucidum. So we will uh, review the images once more. So this is the, you know, this image you can see, this is the cavum septum pellucidum with the cavum verge. And this is the coronal image where it is appearing triangular. So here the cavum, uh, septum pellucidum, and here the cavum verge, which is separating out the fornices. So this is the normal variant. Then you have the cavum velum interpositum. So cavum velum interpositum is a thin triangular space that overlies the thalami and the third ventricle. It typically occurs without the cavum septum pellucidum, displaces the internal cerebral veins inferiorly, and displaces the fornices superiorly. So this triangular area is referred to as cavum velum interpositum. Here, it has displaced the uh, no, fornices superiorly and the internal cerebral veins inferior. And 
earlier we mentioned a condition where you have a box like configuration so this is another box like configuration when you have absent septum pellucidum no this is the, here you have absent septum pellucidum and this is called again, again a box like configuration then uh, there are other normal variants are when you have a mega cisterna magna which is a retrocerebellar csf space measuring more than 10 millimeter in the mid sagittal plane so this is a uh, mega cisterna magna so that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation so you might feel that all of these things are very common but what you need to understand is that these common things are what they are going to ask you for your exam and whatever these uh, kind of things have been discussed when i went for my exam i thought uh, the you know morning glory sign and mickey mouse sign and i did not have a clear idea of what it was uh, referring to so these basic things that if you remember well i think you should do well in your practical exam okay so i will conclude uh, today's presentation with that thank you thank you sir in, in thank you sir question. it was excellent presentation sir thank you dr kuren demyelination is in the next class yeah demyelination and uh, epilepsy i will cover in the last class okay. and infections okay. demyelination epilepsy and some infections okay oh, there is one more sign in continuum dash in N nph dash dash yes who who can say that can anybody answer what is dash disproportionately and large subway recognizes yeah yeah okay yeah. so in summary uh, just to give uh, one one sign uh, can you tell dr anusha what is the sign in cptd sir cptd sir Uh, what is the MRI finding in CBGD, Doctor Kurian? You can ask one one sign in each whatever you have discussed just now. Okay. Cortico basal degeneration, sir. What is the sign in MRI? Uh, it will be parietal atrophy. CBD, uh, cortico basal yeah. degeneration, sir. Parietal atrophy. Asymmetrical. Asymmetrical. Asymmetrical, asymmetrical parietal atrophy. So the so that is something that they always ask, you know, which is the uh, we always say Parkinson's disease is uh, symmetrical. Sorry, asymmetrical. What is the typical Parkinsonian syndrome, which is asymmetrical? That's cortical basal degeneration. Name name of sign in MRI that knife some knife. And uh, yeah, knife blade atrophy. So yeah. knife blade atrophy is typically you know, two conditions. Knife blade atrophy is commonly used. One is no prodromal temporal dementia and second is CBD okay so you know just for a revision uh, you know uh, the swallow tail sign which condition it is seen and can somebody describe that we will make it a little more difficult idiopathic pd we discussed that that it is not only in idiopathic pd correct it will help you to diagnose parkinsonism some but in a patient with idiopathic pd and other atypical parkinsonian syndromes also the swallow tail sign will be present what is the other name of swallow tail sign dorsolateral nigral hyperintensity so the dorsolateral nigral hyperintensity is the other name of the swallow tail sign what are the other did is for uh... hot cross bun sign spinal cerebral rotation okay anything else any other condition cerebral bus please Variant CJD also can have hot cross bun sign. MSA, spinal cerebellar ataxia, and variant CJD. Okay. The pulvinar sign is seen in which condition? Variant CJD. Variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. 
variant Crossfell Jacob disease. Also seen atroperture and infarct. Sir, can you please describe that uh, face of miniature panda? Again. No, I'll, yeah, I will go to that uh, slide. Okay. So here, the face of the miniature panda is seen at the level of pons. So you have the you know, medial longitudinal fasciculus and the central tegmental tract. So this is the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the central tegmental tract that forms the eye of the panda. Then you have the cerebral aqueduct, which is opening into the fourth ventricle, which forms the nose and mouth of the panda. And you have inferiorly the superior medullary velum. The superior cerebellar are pedangles which are not clearly seen here. They form the panda's cheeks. So it's called face of the miniature panda or cub of the giant panda. What is the name of sign in uh, central pontine myelinosis? Trident sign. Trident sign, oil sign. Yeah, Mexican. Oh, oh, I actually, all of those things have to be covered in the next session. I don't know if I will be able to finish all the things together. So, next session, uh, we will. Some, uh, yeah, pit, pit, and all that also is pending, yeah. I think. Next session, okay. we will Anybody definitely have... cover encephalopathy also. The, because they Anybody commonly ask, uh, they uh, what are the basal ganglia? No? Like uh, say Japanese encephalitis, based on the basal ganglia in involvement, uh, how do you uh, basal ganglia necrosis, alcohol, methanol poisoning? All of those uh, things they ask for the exam. So we will cover that in the next session. Yeah, the, they will keep mostly this uh, classical thing like CBGD. Then Vernicus and uh, Rasmussen's. Yeah, this alcohol also cool. we will alcohol also we will yeah. cover in the next session. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then uh, if there are no more questions, we can close the session. Thank you, Dr. Korean, for uh, you, highlighting important uh, exam-related MRI. And uh, we'll continue this session next uh, Thursday, na? Uh, yeah, but not this week, next Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you everyone for participating. We'll Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was very nice. Thanks. Thank you.